a goodie bag for him from Zomato. Can we have a louder round of applause for him? Now this is luck. Right, thank you so much. Enjoy the goodies, sir. Authors will be signing their books at the book signing desk located right at the entrance of Charbag. The festival brochure and flyer with the full program are available for purchase at the JCB Prize for Literature bookshop managed by Full Circle. You can also grab a copy of your favorite book while you're there. Please help us in keeping the venue clean and dispose any waste items in the bins placed all across Diggy Palace. Kindly note that the festival venues are in the no smoking zone and we request you to not smoke in public spaces. You may, however, smoke in the designated areas. Do book your tickets for the music stage held between 23rd to the 25th at Clark's Amir, 6.30 p.m. onwards. Namaskar ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 13th edition of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival in association with Nexa at Charbag. We're delighted to have with us um, Peter Frankopan, introduced by Bruno Masaish. Uh, session number 33, The New Silk Roads, The Present Future of the World. Presented by our sponsor, Aga Khan Foundation. Peter Frankopan, Professor of Global History at Oxford University was named one of the world's top 50 thinkers by Prospect Magazine. And Bruno Massage was the Minister of European Affairs in Portugal from 2013 to 2015. His book, The Dawn of Eurasia, was selected as a book of the year by the Financial Times and Foreign Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Peter Frankopan, introduced by Bruno Massage. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Beautiful day, sunny skies. Uh, well, I want to welcome Peter Frankopan. I think you all know him. Uh, he wrote uh, an extraordinarily successful bestseller called The Silk Roads a few years ago. Uh, we're here to talk about The Silk Roads, but also about the new Silk Roads, to bring the story up today, to talk about the contemporary world, to talk about world politics, to talk about the world economy, and a lot of other things. Let me start, uh, Peter, by asking you, what is it about the Silk Roads that appeals to everyone all over the world? I cannot think of any other idea, any other topic, any other theme that is so universal. No one seems to have a resistance against the Silk Roads. Everyone embraces it. I've never seen anyone expose it as a form of uh, Western or Eastern power. Why is it, and also, by the way, it's a romantic concept that makes us dream. Why is it? Why, what makes it so special? Well, um, well first, it, it, they're not real. <laughs> uh, and so everybody likes stuff because it means that you don't have to define them too much. Um, there's a lot of, you know, historians, we spend a lot of time in um, 
lecture halls and in, in small articles arguing with each other about terminology and phrasing. And it's true, if you put a whole bunch of historians in the room and you ask them about what are the Middle Ages, or what is Europe, uh, what is Africa, uh, you know, we would all come out probably not actually as friends, but with very strong series of opinions with no one agreeing with each other. So labels and terms are very important to define what are we talking about. You know, what does the glo what, is, what, what is medieval? What is late antiquity? What is the modern age? Um, and the Silk Road is quite useful because unless you want to spend your life and career arguing about these phrases, it's a kind of, it's this fluid, as you said, quite romantic um, catchphrase that does different things for different people. So for a British mentality and European mentality, uh, people love the Silk Roads because for them, instinctively, they think about British spies or people working for the state arriving in places like Bukhara in the 1840s and being beheaded in the town square, uh, at trying to play the so-called great game of outmaneuver Russia. That's a kind of big part of Britain's empire at its height where individuals are sent out to explore and find things out. Uh, from a Chinese perspective, the, the Silk Roads talks about not just the modern world, and we'll talk about Belt and Road and China's view of the modern world, but it talks about an uh, old world of particularly Tang and Song Dynasty China, where China is much more connected to its Western neighbors and in a kind of multicultural, pan-Asian civilization of the world. So it's a non-threatening term for the Chinese. If you're looking at European engagement with China, um, the last two or three hundred years have not perhaps had a optimal impact on China and its society and economy, particularly with drug war, opium wars, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite neutral and therefore uh, more, it, more accessible about opening a way that China looks at the past. Uh, the Iranians, of course, think that they invented the Silk Roads because Iranian culture, Persian culture, is so profoundly important as a, as a, as a driver of interconnectivity between East and West. And, and so it, it's, it's a non-threatening word because for states and societies from Africa to Europe to Central Asia to South Asia, you know, here in India, the Silk Roads can also be blended in. It's a little bit more threatening now with China and the Belt and Road, but it speaks of a world that was interconnected a long time before the modern age. So, so I think people that feel, feel um, they like it because you can project, right. you can project onto it, and things you can project onto are, are, can be very helpful. So you said they're not real, and uh, what do you mean by that? And I mean, maybe the audience will be surprised to find out that an historian can write a book about something that doesn't exist, that it's not real. Well, yes, what okay, but then, but then, you know, and I've got some very distinguished colleagues here who write about the Crusades. That's also not real. You know, what, what are these expeditions that we've later labeled? Are they somehow connected to each other? You know, what does the British Empire mean? What does, what does, you know, what, what does colonialism in, uh, in the Americas mean? I think all these things are, I, I don't mean that they're, they're non-existent. What I mean is that they are abstract and they are, um, they are malleable, right? So like with all periods of history, all geographies, you know, I think it's about how does one, um, how, how, clo how much time does one spend trying to define it? I suppose when, when most people think about the Silk Roads, they, they, they usually think about it in the singular, the Silk Road. And in most people's imagination, that means something starts in Xi'an, which you know, has big, big uh, banners outside the city saying the start of the Silk Road, and then you know, goes to eventually Istanbul, your city now, your home city, or maybe to Venice. And quite often people will come up to me and say, is place X or Y, is, it, is Orenburg in Russia on the Silk Road? You know, was Samarkand on the Silk Road and Bukhara, or was Tashkent on the Silk Road? And it sort of imagines in people's mind like it's a, like it's a motorway you know, that connects Jaipur to Delhi, and that either you're on it or you're not on it. But this term was invented in, um, by, by a German geographer in the late 19th century, so there is in fact an Orientalism about this term as well about a choice of, of luxury goods that was moved in very small volumes in you know, silk trade. It, it's, it's small, it's elite, it's perishable, and so on. Um, but the Silk Roads, he chose it in the plural, uh, Seidenschassen, precisely because it encourages you to think about east, west, west, east, but also the north, south, south, north vector that's very, very important too. So it, it, it's, not, non, it's not, not real, I suppose, it's, but it's, it's fluid, and it's a term that just is, I use to talk about any form of exchange. And that can be linguistic, that can be genetic, that can be um, uh, to do with pathogens and pandemics and disease, that can do with c c and obviously commerce, trade, religion, and so on too. So it's just, a, I think, a, a good catch-all to talk about like globalization or like the Middle Ages. It's a sort of nice heading that then the, real, the really stuff that's more interesting is to, is to look at the detail underneath it. We'll talk a little bit later about the 
the threat of pandemics. It's of course in the newspapers now and Peter wrote a piece very recently forecasting that it would be something that would be with us very shortly and in a very dramatic way and you were right about that. Uh, but let me, before we move on to the new Silk Roads, let me ask you a couple of questions. How did people a thousand or two thousand years ago talk about the Silk Roads? Because as you said, they didn't have the term. The term was only invented in the 19th century. Can you give us a little taste of how the Silk Roads were conceived, were described uh, back in the day? Well, no, no, one talk, no one talked about them. Because, I mean, you know, the high register of literature that survives from the past tends to be um, often written by, by, by priesthoods, tends to be to do with civilian administrations that are interested in gathering tax and in working out who's arriving and who's coming and going, both for, like today, both for security reasons. There's a reason why my passport, our passports are checked when we arrive into India. Uh, it's about working out who's coming so you can have a kind of plot, plot statistics and you can work out what your exchanges are. It's also people specific. Some people are more of interest to the authorities than others for security, but also for trading issues. But you know, most of the world in the past, and in fact, even today, it's about your, your local vicinity. It's about your relationship with your, with your small community, fanning out maybe towards cities. So in, in the past, long distance trade was, was elite. It was, re it was relatively small. And most of the trade that was going on is agrarian. It's from, from the countryside to the city. So no one spent a great deal of time, as far as we can tell, really thinking in, in Xi'an or Kaifeng about what anyone was up to in the Mediterranean. But there are periodic um, records of long distance diplomatic missions. You know, in, in the 600s, for example, the seventh century, you know, there's clearly gathering of information going on in, in both in China and in northern India and in, um, in the Mediterranean, as well as on the steppes, about what is going on to do with uh, movement of peoples, migrations, climate change, uh, impacts of what happens when uh, there's dislocations of, and state failure and city failure. That's a kind of quite a normal thing. So there's an awareness in the past that the world is an interconnected place and that geographies that are quite a long way away can be significant for political alliances. But, you know, I'd have thought for 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, no one's really interested. The same way that I think I'm right, and my number might be a little bit wrong. Before we had the general election in the UK, before December, I read something that said that uh, in Britain, the average person spends three minutes per week thinking or talking about politics. So in, in, in our bubble, where everyone is freaking out about Brexit or freaking out about Europe and its direction or about Huawei and 5G, you know, you go down the pub and you go, or you go to the football pitches, the football matches, and you speak to what normal people are talking about, and they really, um, gosh, I'm going to swear, don't, they don't care. They don't care. It's not important for them. You know, in the human experience is, am I going to get lucky tonight? What am I going to eat? And can I feed my children? Maybe not in that order. Uh, let me ask you about India. Um, how does India fit into, into the Silk Roads? If there's a young historian here that wants to write about India and the Silk Roads, what would you, how would you think about it? Uh, well, I guess it depends if you want to try and be uh, a ambitious and write about long periods. You know, it's obviously is difficult. You know, the, one of the big challenges and one of the big excitements about being a historian today is the, um, number one, the availability of new kinds of materials, particularly to do with science, you know, genetic materials, things to do with, with uh, climate science, uh, things to do with, with space archaeology, the way in which we can detect things from, uh, from, from long distance in ways that we hadn't been able to before, that reveal, for example, the existence of caravans arise in places that we can't see from the ground and archaeologists haven't touched. Um, so new materials, that makes a big, big challenge, but that means coming to terms with, with science and the maths. So one of the big problems is that we teach history like a dead subject where you stick with texts and if you're really lucky and you become advanced, you move towards archaeology. And if you're a bit weird, you're told to go and look about coins and lead seals. But the materials that are available are, 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 are growing and becoming more abundant and the way in which they're being interpreted uh, more exciting. So I think that if you're a young historian, you need to be um, not just switching off in your biology classes, but paying quite close attention and your mathematics too, because these are primary skills now for a historian to have. Uh, and I think then in terms of how do, you, how, do you, how do you join India together, well, I think you have to spin the plates like a circus act of looking at the local, looking at the regional, and then looking perhaps at, at the global. And in things like the case of India, clearly the expansion and spread of Buddhism northwards into China uh, is important to work out how profound is this, 
Are we being misled by the written material and by, even by the archaeological material? Uh, what kind of India, what, what does India even really mean in terms of its geographies and its relationships with its neighbors? And, and funnily enough, those are exactly the same questions to ask about India in today's world. You know, where, where does India fit in relationship to other parts of South Asia? Where does it fit in relationship to Iran, particularly post um, taking out of Soleimani? Where does India sit within its context of, of Russia, which supplies more than 70% of its weapons? and in, with its 3,000 kilometer border with China, which is the, still the only one unresolved border that China has in the world. So I think it's trying to be multifaceted and three-dimensional. Uh, and like any historian will tell you, uh, as you know with your books too, the more that you read and above all the more you listen, the better you're going to be at gathering more kinds of pieces of information. Well, one, one of the things that India doesn't like about the Belt and Road Initiative, and the Belt and Road Initiative is a way to, in a way, revive the Silk Roads, is that India, which still thinks of itself as being at the center of the Eurasian supercontinent and being at the center of some of these uh, trade connections, is excluded from the Belt and Road. So that allows us to turn to the modern world. You say at the beginning of uh, the most recent book, The New Silk Roads, and it's a sentence that has caught a lot of attention, and I'm not sure I agree with it, but I want to uh, hear you explain it, uh, that the most important decisions in the world today are not taken in London, in New York, in Paris, but they are taken in Istanbul, in Delhi, in Islamabad, in Tehran, and in Beijing. What do you mean by that? And do you really believe that? Well, yes. <laughs> okay. Bru but Bru no, Bruno, no, uh, Bruno used to be a professor, so I'm familiar me, with this tactic. Okay, but you know, I'm sure, I'm sure people are thinking, you know, the most powerful army in the world is in the United States. Uh, right. Right. Uh, the European Union continues to be the largest single market. Technology is mostly concentrated in the United States, in Japan, and okay. in Europe. So okay, so um, let's take a step. That's all. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, last night, the city of Wuhan was shut down, right, with 11 million people inside it. And as it happened, like you said, and, and historians are not in fact, they're often very bad predictors of the future. But I was asked in, in December to write something about what I thought the biggest challenge was for the 2020s. And um, I was told, look, you know, free wheel about China or military confrontation or whatever. And in fact, I wrote about pandemic. And e even I, I mean, it's no, no particular um, uh, thrill, but to see that a city can be quarantined uh, shows that the challenges we face in the future, it's not just about the world of milk and honey coming from Asia and rivalries to big o open markets. It's about the fundamentals of what happens in the world. So if you want to fix climate change, it makes no difference how much you re recycle in Lisbon or in Oxford or in Dalkey or wherever it might be. It's about getting infrastructure investment right to be able to manage energy consumption patterns and waste consumption patterns above all in the two most populous countries in the world, India and China. And if we can't support that, if it can't get done, then we're all going to fry and all take the consequences. You know, by and large, the Netherlands is very good at its recycling. Could it do more? Yes. But the big population struggles are, are all in these areas. Uh, the biggest emitters of carbon, of greenhouse gases, and of things that, that generate the climate problems we have are Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, and India. And that, that's, that's number one. Number two, as it happens in these parts of the world that, that I'm talking about, it's where 65% of the world's population live. So uh, right now, um, the assumption is that, that by 2025, the GDP of all the cities of Asia will pass the United States and the EU in terms of their G combined GDP. And by 2035, so 15 years on, it'll be 30% higher. So Asia is becoming, at the moment, things might change. You know, Wuhan might be, <coughs> just been there. <coughs> um, uh, you know, Wuhan, this might be a, a prelude of what's to come, but the mega cities and the pressures that those are under, <laughs> uh, the, 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 potential, the potential for, for breakdown of uh, rivalries, of, uh, of state competition, it doesn't mean that we're not immune from that in Europe, but it's more likely to me that if we have state-on-state -state activity, it'll be Asian-based, either between Asian competitors or, or outside interventions like in Iran, like in Iraq, like in Afghanistan, and so on. Um, so at the moment, 17 of the world's fastest growing cities are in India, and 10 of the top 10, all 10 of the fastest growing cities are here. 
So not just pollution, not just energy consumption, not just greenhouse, that we're all in a global society. The two big themes in global history that really do unite us over thousands and thousands of years are, are climate and pandemics. And uh, Asia is the petri dish for, for one and is the driver of the second. As it happens beyond that, you know, the, the natural resources that lie in this part of the world, the demographics, it means that, that it's not that Europe and the United States are not important, but clearly the US in particular is trying to shape what kind of Asian future comes. And as you say, India is, take, is choosing a very different path to China, in some cases deliberately uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a response to what China is trying to do. But it seems to me that everything that, that matters today really is to do with this Asian environment. You know, so things like the standards for internet, for facial recognition, for video surveillance. Uh, we have our own standards in, the United, in, in Europe and in, in the US, but China is setting those across almost everywhere in Asia and 90% and of Africa so far, where South Africa is the only state which has a free, notionally free internet system. Those standards introduced by not just Chinese hardware and so on and software interventions, but by working out what is it that a role that a state should have when it regulates its, its citizens. And it's clear to me that we're on a different track in Europe and the US to how we are, to how things are here in, in the East. So I, I do think that across multiple different vectors, um, these things all lead to uh, what we are, what, where we are in, in, um, in the world right now. I mean, so, in, you know, just in cities, it's my current obsession. You know, there are nine cities in the US with a population of more than a million. And there are 156 million in China, uh, 156 cities with population more than a million in China. And each of those is a potential Wuhan. You know, Chongqing with its suburban areas, 30 million people. Beijing, Shanghai, which you know well, 25 million each. And infection rates, uh, consumptions of energy, food requirements, you know, and, and, and avian flu and bird, you know, swine flu have been a big thing. Last year, China lost 350 million pigs to swine flu. And you know, these kinds of pressures are ones that we are all invested into. If you're a pig farmer in Denmark, this has been the best year of your life because global pork prices have gone up what they have. But China consumes half of the world's pigs, more than half of the world's eggs, you know, the wheat and the bread and the rice consumptions. It's, it's phenomenal. So put these two countries together, India and China, and you're halfway there, factor in these other countries, and uh, you, know, you go you're quite, quite a long way to thinking that that's where we should spend more time working on. I had a conversation with a Chinese ambassador to Portugal, I'm Portuguese, the other day, and he told me that Portugal should be very interested in China because we can export endless amounts of pigs to China. China every year consumes an amount of pigs that if you put them all together, all the pigs together, one after another, each year it will take us from the earth to the moon. And this is from the, from the Chinese ambassador, so you have to trust it. Now let me ask you... A couple of questions about... I, only one way, though, right? No, only one way, yeah. <laughs> so you can climb all the way to the moon. Let me ask you a couple of questions about China before, before we forget. And there's no way we can forget China. First question. I mean, even two, three years ago, almost everyone argued that China was unstoppable, at least in the sense that it would overcome the United States in terms of the size of its economy. The last year, the last few months, you actually can hear a few voices disagreeing with this. There was an important research unit yesterday that said like 2050, the United States is still gonna be the largest economy in the world. The other day in a festival like this one, I saw the historian Neil Ferguson argue that in his lifetime, and he's more or less your age, in his lifetime- hey, Hang on a minute, Bruno. <laughs> I, I think he is. Sorry, if he's you know, here, I'm sorry. Yeah, he is, yeah, he is, people yeah, he is. can Google yeah, he is. that in his lifetime, uh, China would not overcome the United States. Um, do you want to make a prediction? Do you want to tell us what your... I mean, this is not a scientific answer, but what is your instinct? Is China unstoppable or not, economically? Uh, it, it's tr tricky. So the, the economists have been predicting the failure of the China model for... for two generations, you know, since, since the sort of first opening up uh, the late 80s and then above all, well, 78 and then the 80s and then above all after 89, um, you know, China has had an extraordinary period of growth. And economists have been trying to predict where, when the wheels come off the wagon. And there are lots of reasons why that might happen. You know, urbanization is a challenge. You know, the, the need to invest into infrastructure is, is phenomenal. I mean, in the, next, in the next 15 years, China is expected to urbanize more than the entire population of the United States. So 350, more million, 350 million more people to live in cities. And that's not easy to budget for, it's not easy to plan for, et cetera, et cetera. There are very ambitious plans that the Chinese leadership keep announcing about 
how by 2025 you need to be able to get from any city to another city within three hours, you need to be able to commute within 25 minutes, all these kinds of targets. And uh, what we've learned in history is that a top-down economy tends not to work very well because uh, single-party states, ones that have an instinct to be um, authoritarian or suppressive, so there are, there are two to three million people in China who work on internet censorship alone, that you harvest out good ideas, well, you harvest out debate, and then therefore you harvest out good ideas. We in the Socratic tradition, the reason we do this kind of uh, s tutorial system in Oxford is to allow ideas to be molded, pushed, and it's a brutal, it can be a brutal experience, but it, there tends to be a reversion towards telling the boss what he wants to hear. Usually he, sometimes she, wants to hear in, in China. And that creates inefficiency, that creates a super tanker that it's very hard to turn around. But having said that, you know, people like Francis Fukuyama have said, you know, if, if uh, the China model keeps on going for the next 10 years, we have to review whether socialism maybe has something in it after all. You know, this idea that there's a, a third or a new way, which is how China talks about it. And I know this is a book you're writing now about, about how, how history might be changing in its, in its prediction. So China's got a lot of problems to deal with. Uh, can a state stay in power? Can you allow enough oxygen, to the ta gas into the tank to allow economic growth, social mobility, with a population that size, with, uh, you know, uh, with urbanization, with provincial levels of debt as high as they are, with real regional inequality. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but these last 30 years have suggested that China is better at doing that than perhaps we think. The, the challenge is, is like all stockbrokers would say, past performance is no predictor of the future. And it could be that China is at a sort of tipping point where that slowdown of the economy that we're seeing, the transition to manufacturing, mean that there's, there's less maneuverability and therefore the, the ability for the state to keep delivering things that the citizens want maybe changes and therefore the expectation and the relationship about what it is that people want uh, modifies. So uh, I'm, not, I'm too, um, uh, too anxious to try and, and call it, but the, we, outside all of that, we've then got very significant pressure on China's rise being managed by a, a very aggressive US administration that's not just aggressive towards China, it's aggressive towards, towards everybody that, that may send things in, in unusual directions. Well, the, the great thing about 30-year predictions is that you know, by 2050, no one is going to remember your prediction if you're wrong. And if you're right, you'll bring it up yourself. <laughs> so 2050, what's the largest economy in the world, United States, China, or India? I, I would expect, I mean, the, 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 so I can defer to people who have a higher pay grade than me. Uh, so the new Russian strategic plan and the chief of, of the Russian general staff anticipates a war within a European arena by 2025, right? So if we, we've had a very unusual period of 30 years since Tiananmen Square, since the Berlin Wall came down, of uh, these last 30 years have been the, the best three decades in global poverty eradication in history. You know, child born here while we're talking anywhere in the world is going to have a longer life expectancy than any of its ancestors, be more literate, more likely that his mother survived or her mother survived childbirth, more likely that they'd survive childbirth. And that's a wonderful thing. But this 30 years of um, cooperation, multilateralism, uh, ability to resolve and, uh, disputes and um, ability to avoid war, you know, despite, and, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, obvious uh, uh, exceptions to this and a couple of other places, What's unusual is that uh, despite that all having worked quite well, there's real pressure on that world of cooperation, of collaboration, of the so-called international rules-based order. And one would assume if you're, a, uh, if you're a betting man or woman that uh, getting things right all the time would be unlikely to be, um, you know, to, to, to be able to be that lucky. I think this has been a very unusual maybe 50 or 60 years since the Cold War, I mean, since the Second World War, and, but, you know, the confrontations in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, you know, and so on. Uh, but the challenge today is not just we have states that are doing the kind of me first, uh, I want what's right for our workers, here in India as well, of course, as the United States and in China, etc. It's that there are now new rules of engagement where it's not clear how we're going to resolve the new technologies that we have, including biomimicry, including biotech, nanotech, and the disruptive capabilities that are very strongly incentivized to deliver short-term um, results for individual states. So this world of fracture fragmentation, the downside looks to me profoundly high, um, and yet it seems that that's the direction we're going. So if, if 
we had not invented the internet, if there were no new technologies on the table, if they were, or if they were regulated very heavily from the, you know, globally top down, then maybe differently. But in things like, you know, cyber right now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's terrifying. We don't know what the rules of engagement are. If, if there are, if there are small scale cyber attacks, what are the kind of correct responses? And a lot of people I, I know, and you know too, Bruno, who work in these kind of areas, are very concerned that, that at least with nuclear war, it became clear that one person presses one the button and you send one missile that you get two back and then we all, we're all dead. But you know, now if a, if a state or, or a non-state actor, not just a fundamentalist, but hacker group shuts down the city supply of, or electricity supply of you know, Chicago or Chongqing, for whatever reason, um, how does that get responded to? And that uncertainty means that these new technologies uh, provide uncertainty and, and the possibility of fragmentation. And again, historians of the past, of the, of, of the deep past, of prehistory and of, uh, of the Middle Ages know that introductions of new technology give a sudden competitive advantage to one side and they always get used and exploited because while you have that advantage, you need to use it. So the defense spending here in South Asia, in submarines, you know, the, the K-4 that was tested yesterday, the arrival of a, of a Su-30 squadron that's just been deployed in, in Tanjavu two, you know, 24 hours ago, speaks of a world that, that drifts towards uh, confrontation and, co and collaboration. And in those kind of scenarios, uh, all bets are off about who can grow because it's a different kind of story. W one more question about China. So I give a lot of lectures around the world about the Belt and Road Initiative. And the Belt and Road Initiative is one of those examples that show that Peter is right, and that the Silk Roads are rising again. It's a plan to project Chinese influence and Chinese power all over the world, but in particularly across Eurasia towards Europe, controlling areas of energy production, uh, having access to important markets and technology uh, all across this vast geography. I'll ask you the question that I get asked all over the world, and I've started to get a little bit annoyed with the question, so I'll, I'll lobby it back to you. Are you in favor or against the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, I don't think I've got a choice, do I? I mean, I'm not, I'm, uh, I, mean I write books about it, but I'm not responsible for it. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't really matter whether I'm in favor or against. I mean, I think that the, the, the challenge, a bit like with the Silk Roads, is to disaggregate, because there are clearly different elements to this, and one has to look uh, project specific, country specific, and also the implementation that different projects are at different stages of, you know, so in, in Kazakhstan, for example, four out of 51 projects that have been funded are under, are under construction. So lots of things get pushed through, lots of things get greenlit, lots of things look like they've got funding. Uh, CPEC and the, the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, a very good case in, po in point. I know you were there just last week. So one has to, I think, step back and, and step away from the kind of strategic master plan. I think it is an Orientalism that we tend to think, particularly in, in, in the West, that uh, Chinese people, they, they're very good at long-term strategy. You know, we tend to think that they always have a plan and they're very good at mathematics in Shanghai. All kids in, in, are much better at maths than they are in Lisbon and London. And therefore, you know, we're up against some kind of uh, joined up thinking. Uh, I think it's more complicated than all of that. There are clearly threads that go through it, as you say, energy, resource security, food security to some extent. Uh, then there are things to do and around um, what China's perception is about internal threats and Xinjiang and the treatment of Uyghurs is, is part of that story where it looks like that the one of the things that really spooked the Chinese leadership is that they hadn't clocked how radicalization had really kicked in under the radar of people who'd come back. It wasn't large numbers of people from um, Western China had gone to fought, fought, fought fight for ISIS, but, there, but when they were back, so from what we can tell, and there's much more better research than I've done on this, um, that, that the, what, what scared them in Beijing was that this, this had been, they hadn't picked it up, and that heavy, heavy role of the state in surveillance and so on has now come in as a result. So there were lots of different elements of all of this, and one could get carried away of thinking that um, there is a kind of uh, strategic vision behind every single element to it. And, you know, the truth is some of these projects have gone very badly, badly wrong publicly, and, um, but they're not always quite what they seem. So the port of Hambantota in Sri Lanka, for example, which you know, normally gets written off as being a, 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 you know, the, the, a form of neo-colonialism where the Chinese took possession of something that defaulted. Actually, the port hadn't defaulted. Sri Lanka has very limited foreign, foreign currency reserves, and so they took an upfront payment of $1.2 billion to help pay off short-term debts and then gave a 70-year lease to China. And China's not very good at explaining all of that. I mean, in fact, I was just talking to a very distinguished China scholar beforehand, and he's absolutely, absolutely right uh, that, you know, why you want a base in Sri Lanka for your ships that 
in th you know, you're not allowed to have naval vessels, p uh, military vessels p put in. You know, we, we just assume that this must be part of a master plan. So I think it's not about being for or against it. It's about China trying to look for what its future is in the, in the world of tomorrow. Some of it is to do around its own domestic agenda. I think we don't look at that at all closely enough. Some of it is to do about excess capacity that China needs to be exporting. Some of it is to do with a, a, a strategy, but those are, you can isolate and work those through bit by bit. But I think it, it's real. And I mean, the truth is, and you, we, we last saw each other in, in Central Asia before Christmas, you know, uh, lots of these states, including India, including Vietnam, including Kazakhstan, Russia, have a kind of strategic vision of what they think their state needs. You know, in China, for example, they announced before Christmas that uh, by 2022, no state-owned business or, state or, or, or public institution is allowed to use Western-made hardware or software. In, in Europe, we don't have that sense of our direction to travel. We're not quite sure what we want to do. We keep saying free trade agreements, free trade agreements, and so on. The US is, a, has, is maybe taking a different view about what it thinks the world of tomorrow will look like and how to prepare for it. But I think in, in Europe, we're, 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 we're out to one side of what we think we should be doing. So here in India, the kind of north-south tra north transportation corridor, the investments into Chahabar and to, to looking at uh, relationships with Iran, uh, you know, what happens in the next door neighbor states in Bangladesh and, and, uh, and Myanmar and so on. It's a very important part of joining those dots together, which is in a way, it's a belt and road of its own of if you build roads, if you invest in infrastructure, how do you cooperate with people who have similar aligned interests to you? And China, I think that the scorecard is sort of five out of 10. It's done that quite successfully in some places, but it scored quite a lot of own goals in others. I want to leave about uh, 15 or 20 minutes for questions. I assume there's a microphone on the side, right? Uh, okay, but one last how, question. How do you answer it, by the way, Bruno? Uh, when you get well, asked. I actually, I, I actually say that I am in favor of the initiative, but I think it needs uh, deep reforms. I just think that it's better to have a China open to the world than a China closed to the world. And I think the Belt and Road opens up China to the world. So in principle, the concept, I think, is a good thing. So I think the, the, the challenge is, is that we, all over the world, are becoming more exposed to, um, to China and China's supply chains. And China, at the same time, is becoming more detached from ours uh, because of its, its growth. But I mean, even here in India, where, you, as, you, as you mentioned, Bruno, the, the Belt and Road is, is anathema. The, the Indian government has refused to send delegations to the Belt and Road forums. It publicly speaks out against it, lobbied at the UN to not let uh, Belt and Road get adopted as a kind of, you know, as a, as a UN blueprint, which obviously has va had value in China and was thwarted by the Indians. But in fact, um, levels of Chinese investment into India trebled last year and uh, doubled the year before then. You know, and, and assessments about what kind of investment will come into India from, from China, you know, it's somewhere between the expectation of 60 to 80 billion in the next three years. So there's a lot of, co co you know, there's a lot of co cooperation, collaboration in trying to find efficiency that, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're subject to state intervention, state interferences, and so on. But um, I think it's, it's trying to work through what, what those what risks come further down the line. I mean, as it happens, the Asian Development Bank thinks that um, in, in the next 15, in the next, well, now 10 years, I was going to say 12, 10 years, Asia as a whole needs something like $1.7 trillion of investment. So on that scale, you know, China's investments in Belt and Road of 70, 80 billion a year, it's, it's, not, it's not a lot. You know, there's plenty of space for multilateral institutions, for the ADB, for Japan, which is a very, uh, is a very active uh, participant across Asia, but doesn't get written about, doesn't get talked yep. about. I think we need a balance between different projects uh, right. similar in nature. One last question before I open up to the, pub the public. I think I need to ask this question because I think one of your great merits in in these two books is to alert everyone to the fact of change. I think that's the historian's task to people tend to assume that the world is going to remain always the same. And I think a historian is particularly well placed to say it, it has suffered dramatic changes in the past and it will suffer dramatic changes in the future. And we have to prepare for that. But one of the most dramatic changes we have to prepare for is climate change. Just came back from Pakistan and I was surprised because I know in Europe, in places like Sweden and Germany, you cannot, you know, I, I, I went to give a talk in Germany and someone told me, are you going to talk about climate change? And I said, I wasn't planning to. Well, you have to. And in Pakistan, it was quite similar, in fact. People wanted fervently to talk about climate change. Uh, how do you think the problem of climate change is going to be solved in, in, in just two or three minutes, Peter, if it will be solved? What, is the, what, is, what should be our strategy? Because time is really running out. Uh, with its infrastructure investment in Asia, its infrastructure investment in, in India, 
and in, into China, um, and reduction of, and it's not, just, it's not just about emissions, it's also about waste. You know, 85% of Bangladesh's groundwater is polluted or cont and contaminated. And that will lead in the near future to, if not state failure, then large scale famine and collapse. And if that, you know, that, so we focus on the, um, on rising sea levels and 50% of the world's population live in coastal cities, more or less. And so, uh, you know, rises of sea, sea levels will have a direct impact on those. On top of that, there's the hurricanes, the monsoons, the typhoons that create enormous amounts of damage uh, and cost, but also waste. So it's about waste and investment and about planning things through. And in fact, some states like, like in Southeast Asia, in, in Thailand, for example, to some extent Cambodia too, um, China's been quite effective at, at, at trying to work through some of these problems. But you know, even in China, a third of the groundwater is infected. The metal seepage into, our, into agricultural land is such that, that if you want to make your fortune, we should, do, we should go into baby milk production uh, because Chinese company will buy anything to do with, with formula I food. I already have, actually. Okay, well, you're, you're paying for drinks well, later. Que questions, please, yeah. and uh, keep it very short. Uh, maybe identify yourself quickly at the beginning. Do you prefer one question at a time? I think two or three, two if, or three. if there are two or three. Okay, please, uh, please while, go while ahead. While we wait for the microphone, so the, the, the short answer is that rich countries need to be investing into de the developing world, but in today's world, I can't see the capacity for a German taxpayer or Portuguese taxpayer, and certainly not a British taxpayer, to think that it's our responsibility to be building sanitation plants, helping with agricultural investment, helping with cleaning up energy consumption in other parts of the world, because we, it's a me first world. Hello, Let's get three afternoon. questions then. Good afternoon. My name's Cordelia. I wondered if you could talk about the impact of the one child policy and the fact that I understand it's just come to an end and the work, um, people coming into work now in China and now suddenly the amount of new people coming into the workforce have suddenly fallen because we're now at the back end of that and that China's now suddenly realizing it's got demographic problems that way around. Thank you for being succinct. Second question. I don't know how you can see anybody? I, I'm staring you can into... Out, you, go, you have to the monitor, I think, because it's very difficult over there. Go Good evening. The light. Yeah. My name is Ravjit. Uh, to be, I'll start with a disclaimer. I have not read your book, but now I intend to. So, thank you. It's available next door. I'll sign it for free. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you'll gift it to free. <laughs> then I'll, I'll sign it twice. <laughs> then buy two, you should buy one for you. Sorry. Yeah, maybe we'll do a buy one, get one. Yeah. All right. So uh, my question is, you know, you mentioned some time back that the greater part of the decisions now are being taken in Istanbul, New Delhi, Beijing. What are your thoughts on inclusiveness? What are your thoughts when you talk about the stans, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan? I'm sure you've been to Dushanbe and all these places. And especially with the political situation there, they have no great industrial base to talk about. So where does inclusiveness figure Okay. in this new world order that you talk about. Okay. Just one more question. We'll have other rounds, don't worry, I think. Hi, my name is Riaz and my question to you is that you said that the Belt, and, uh, Belt Initiative with China is uh, good. However, what's happening is that China is creating humongous amount of debt on the countries which lie on the way and accept that initiative. And at a stage, they would in fact be in a position to buy over nations because of the debt that they're creating. So how is good? How is it good? I, I, yeah. And that's what I want to understand. Okay. Okay. So I, I didn't say it was good. I said I didn't have a choice because it's not my idea. Uh, I'm a commentator. So I'm trying to uh, understand and assess it. Uh, what, what the more sanguine way, I think, of stepping back from that question, I'll take them in reverse order, uh, is um, look, what, what, what a lot of these states will say is, we need investment, and it's not coming from anywhere else. So not all states are stupid, not all states are corrupt, not all states walk blind into these kind of discussions and negotiations. Uh, first, uh, there are ch challenges with debt, and like anybody who's ever dealt with a bank, the challenge or the question is always, if you get into trouble, how will your bank behave, right? This is what went wrong in the global financial crisis in 2008. It turned out that the banking system in the West was set up to exploit and, sc and screw over their own customers. And so the big question will be, what will China do when there are structural defaults? Will it do what, like it, what it looks like it did in Sri Lanka of, of playing a game where it took control of a strategic asset? 
or will it restructure, will it write off loans, and so on. And again, project by project, it's a mixed message. So in Ethiopia, where the railway was built was much too expensive, China extended the terms, it renegotiated over a much longer repayment period, and behaved in a way that seems to me perfectly okay. Other cases, it hasn't worked out quite that well. So it all depends on what the behavior will be in Beijing, and also will that behavior be, will the choice be made based on um, decisions made by the leadership and by the economic situation back in China itself, where a lot of these banks investment and, and um, uh, banks set up to support Belt and Road projects have clearly overexposed themselves. So they may not have a choice about recalling loans. H having said that, one does need to also think, does China really want to be controlling a railway system in Ethiopia, for example? You know, this idea about imperialism is one that feels very natural to Europeans because, well, that's what we did to the rest of the world. We went out to colonize, we went out to go and exploit and so on. And it, it may well be that that's what China wants to do, but Mohamed Mahathir, the, pr the Prime Minister of, uh, of, um, of Malaysia, who's now you know, 102, 93, he was asked about this, about China, about pipelines and the railways that have been built into Malaysia and so on. He said, look, um, uh, the Europeans reached the Malay Peninsula in 1517, and two years later we were colonized. Right? China's been on, in our neighborhood for the last three or 4,000 years, and we have some idea we should try and work together well. So I think we need to be, um, a, be a bit more, um, sta stand back a little bit to look at these projects. Prime Minister Cambodia, Cambodia's an authoritarian state. The Prime Minister there said, um, you know, lots of people get off the airplane from the United States or from Europe telling us what we should be doing with our economy. But the only people who get off the airplane who want to invest here are from China. And so I think if we want to, to respond, if we want to take pressure away from debt diplomacy, if we want to be engaged in that process, then it's about, you know, will, will, will India help upgrade the thermal plant in Bishkek? You know, uh, Dushanbe in Tajikistan is closer to where we are here than Mumbai is. Right, so this is, and I love the fact when I arrive into Delhi airport, it says Delhi airport, the best in India and Central Asia. Right, so this is India's neighborhood too. So will the Indian government taxpayer be interested in, in doing some of these uh, investment projects too? So uh, we need to be, have a balance to what China is doing. There, is, there are endless US, US initiatives bubbling up now that will try to offer an alternative. Uh, but a lot will depend on how China behaves. I think that's absolutely right. As far as inclusivity, and it's the same story with demographics, uh, the population in, in, in China is getting older very rapidly. Uh, as a sort of rule of thumb, generally populations that get older tend to become more concerned. There are all the economic costs that have of supporting healthcare, supporting uh, old age care provision and so on. But one of the challenges is, is older societies tend to be more conservative. Uh, they tend to be more resistant towards kinds of change. They tend to be less liberal and, and less relaxed about things like sexuality, tolerance, religion and so on. And so one of the, one of the, one of the questions are, are the, the, the different velocities of China getting older, India getting, getting younger. Um, and so the, the end of the one child policy is an attempt belatedly to try to correct that kind of imbalance. But clearly this has long term consequences for the Chinese economy. As, as far as inclusivity in Central Asia goes, well, actually the society, over the long term, looking back at the, the world that I really fell in love with when I, fell in, when, I, when I found this part of the world, of step nomadic societies, of, uh, of, um, of how clan structures work and how the land is used by, uh, you know, these are actually very sophisticated societies that are not quite what they seem from the outside. It's true that all the Central Asian republics have a single figure at the top who behaves as a, uh, as a, as a chieftain, uh, but they have enormous uh, mineral wealth, not, not all in the same distribution, um, but, uh, the challenge in these countries is how to create, and in all our countries, how to create a meritocracy, right? So um, it sounds to reason that in whatever, whichever country you're born in, you want the people who are most qualified and most intelligent to reach the top. And right now, in fact, if you're born today in Kazakhstan, you have a, in the bottom 20%, you are more likely to leave that bottom 20% than if you're born in the UK, right? So actually these societies, oh, this is the Gini coefficient, by the way, it's not my own personal view, this is measurable. Um, these societies are not necessarily bad. At the top, it's a different story. The sort of top 1% that is very good at taking cash out of the system um, uh, and in looking after itself. But actually, that, that works quite well with, uh, with the Chinese model, where we assume that everyone wants loans to be transparent and open. 
actually most people would like to be able to cream off money. And a, a friend of ours who's written about the Belt and Road, John Hillman, he says that the Belt and Road is a middleman's dream. You know, if you're an official in a state where you're, uh, you know, you're negotiating hundreds of millions of dollars a contract, get, getting a kickback is, is very much in your interests. We in the West want to think that we do things cleanly and transparently, but you know, right now, I said, I said to my friend Frank before here, you know, in the United States per day, pharmaceutical industry spends $1.5 million lobbying in Congress. So, you know, we have different ways of, of getting decisions through the system to how things work in other parts of the world. Three more questions. Uh, there's, I can only see the first few. Is there anybody under the age of 21 who wants to ask a question? Yes. Please, you definitely, you can't have a beard like that if you're under 21. But anybody young, I'd particularly like young people if they, yeah. yeah. Here, great. And then there's somebody further back there, yeah. Shall, shall yes. I go first? Yeah. Okay, yeah. quick one. Um, Raf Manji here from Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, in terms Thank of God it's not Christchurch, Oxford. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> we, we are twin, but that's a different <laughs> story. In, in terms of the description of, of the Silk Road from Xi'an, let's say, to Istanbul, and the numbers you're talking about in terms of Asia, in terms of growth, infrastructure, demand, investment, population, how relevant is Europe? to what's going to happen in Asia and therefore the globe over the next 20, 30 years. Okay, good. Young chap here, and there's somebody further back as well. Hi, um, I'm Eric. So I am a student of history and I remember you mentioned that to get more involved with the past and to find more things, we need to transcend the boundaries that we have been looking in so far. You know, thus far we've been looking at materials, but there are other, there are other things like space archaeology and other materials, but I think that India is really not catching up. We are, we are not there yet. Already history is considered a thing of the past. It's taught like it is a dead subject. So how do we transcend these boundaries to make the past look more accessible and to make history something that's very much in the present? Very okay, much so I'm gonna, so that's such a question. Thank you. But I suspect you're probably a better person to answer that than me. What do you think? <laughs> it's, it's really a question, what is it that you as a young historian what is it that you want to need that you don't have? And how do, how do people like me and the other wonderful historians at this, um, uh, at this festival, what is it that we can do to make it better and easier for you? So uh, in my own way, I started to go out, conduct events, make the past look like it's very much here because you know there are patterns. We repeat ourselves, we are humans, and we have been following a certain pattern. And I guess... The one way in which we can make the past the most accessible is by seeing that all of us as a human race, all of us are in this together. We've always been in this together. And you know, th th there are ways in which we uh, really respect old and antique items. You know, I collect old books and I, I, I do things that are, uh, I, I collect things that are no longer the thing of the present. But people don't do that anymore right now. So people don't collect things in the present and make them fe and, and feel that you know, these can be resourceful in the future. So we need to take care of both the past and the present to make it more resourceful for the future. Okay, so that which I, I completely agree with you. Yes. And uh, as it happens, we, we will still do a couple of questions. So don't, don't give a big round of applause. But I mean, no, 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 well, to you, a well, round of applause to the young man, yeah, of course, for being brave. Um, but what I, but in fact, what I was going to say, which I, I should have said when I came on, is that you know, I love coming to Jaipur. I love this literary festival. I love the people who organize it. I love the fact that it's free. I love the fact that in the middle of the afternoon, people come and listen. And well, the best that we historians can do is to be invited to, to, to come and talk. You know, if, if people weren't invited to come and talk about the Reconquista in Spain, which you should come and listen to Brian Catlos or about Saladin, Jonathan Phillips talking about here, you know, then history would die. If only people want to talk about fiction or about the Belt and Road Initiative and what's happening today, that only works if people come to these talks, they buy the books, and, and we keep being invited. So the best we can do is to, is to make it sound relevant, to make it sound interesting. But you know, I can tell you, if, if there was no one here in this tent, uh, no one, we wouldn't get invited again. So these kinds of organizations, that, that it's a huge machine to make something like this work, all going on behind the scenes, the amount of work and effort and energy and money that goes into it. But the, the best we can do is to, by, by making history alive, to explain why things that happened 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 years ago, why are they not, they don't have to be relevant to today. You know, we don't have to connect, but they have to be interesting and they have to open our minds to think about things in a different way. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing 
to be here in Jaipur, to be flown here. I mean, it's bad for Greta Thunberg, I do know that. But, <laughs> but to be asked to come and talk. And so we, we do do our best, but the best thing I can hope that you do is to study hard, read, and don't just read what your teachers tell you, read different things. Do you have a copy of my book? <laughs> do, do you have a copy of my book? Because I'll bu buy you a copy afterwards if you come, if you come to the tent. Uh, but it's to, it's to read, and it's a bubble, it's to read things that other people don't read, because that, that's the best single way. So I know there was a question at the back there too. Hey, um, my question's really quite grim, um, and it's about what's been labelled the 21st century bottleneck. And so some of the topics you've already touched on, China, pandemics, climate change, but we have other prescient problems in our times, biotechnology, and genetic manipulation, immigration, nuclear threat that's being downplayed by my generation, um, privacy, privacy, cybersecurity, AI, automation, automated weapons, uh, global cooperation. Electromagnetic pulse bombs. <laughs> and, and so there's my, a lot. yeah, there's a lot. My, my question is, um, are you hopeful in this? And is this a unique point of crisis? Are we misperceived? Uh, is the common anxiety that's felt by so many a misperception, or is this really a unique point of crisis? And what are the okay. solutions? Okay, so I've got a minute and 11 seconds. Um, and Europe too, yeah. Uh, look, you know, we are a wonderful species as well as a super destructive one. You know, if anything tells you how rich and varied and fabulous we all are as human beings. It's, it's the Jaipur Literary Festival. You know, the range, the ability to come and listen and sometimes to talk. Uh, you know, we are quite resilient as, as, a, as, a, as a species. You know, we are capable of murdering each other in vast numbers and we've done that a lot in the past. But, you know, we are, we are quite good at, at making progress. You know, all the things that are in the, the, the positive column are, are terrific as well. So, it's very voguish to talk about the end of the world and how these things are going to challenge us. You know, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic because I think most people are pragmatic. It's a question of how do we find ways of, of, of working all together. You know, for, for what it's worth, I'm a lot older than you, well, obviously, or, or you wouldn't have got to ask the question, but I grew up and uh, once a month on a Friday, uh, we had a drill at two o'clock where we had to learn how to hide under our wooden desk because our, my school was near a um, RAF base that was one of the supposed, in fact, it turns out it was a Soviet uh, prime target if there was a nuclear war. So I grew up knowing that nuclear war was inevitable in my lifetime. And that threat over the last 30 years has gone away. So if it's how do we deal with um, you know, data theft, cybercrime, biotech, pandemics, you know, those are bad, but I, I'd like to think that all of us in... 10, 15 years, 20 years, we'll all still be alive. And if we're not, the things like pandemic that get us is not because of bad decisions that human beings, well, they are bad decisions that human beings make, but I, I, I think we should be uh, more upbeat. You know, you can talk yourself into a, into a crisis too, but it's important to be aware of what these problems are. As, as far as Europe goes, well, you know, look, I think in, in Europe, apart from the fact that um, we're having a major existential crisis about who we are, what's our role in the world, you know, Bruno has very strong opinions too about quite rightly, about what the European Union and what Europe could do better, whether it's capable of reform, uh, whether it's direction to travel away from being a sort of united, you know, was set up as a, as a trade bloc to be strategic, potentially military, potentially uh, uh, social as well, and, and so on. Uh, you know, you can argue about whether we think that's right. Uh, uh, coming from a Brexit country like, like the UK, it may be that Britain is the first in the queue to, to jump overboard because it's taken a view through all sorts of wrong and all, all sorts of reasons that its future is better off uh, under its own management. But I think, I think in Europe we are still extremely rich, as Bruno said. Uh, we're a big market, but we are, we are consumers. And if you read the brilliant anarchy by William Dalrymple, um, it will remind you that we in Europe have been very good at exploit, uh, exploiting other parts of the world. And maybe it's our chance, and our, maybe it's our turn to now be exploited by other people. Um, we've had a good 350 years in Europe dominating the world, the global affairs and so on. But in tomorrow's world, those big financial centers like Delhi, like Mumbai, like Shanghai, like Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, you keep listing them. Already we see a shift of wealth asset management. We see a wealth of infrastructure investments away from Europe. So Europe needs to be highly competitive to survive. And in the past, that's worked quite well. You know, there are more 
uh, you know, more Nobel Prize winners at Trinity College Cambridge alone than, than almost every other country in the world. And what, what they'll say in, in Tsinghua University, which Bruno and I know well, even though it was ranked number one in one of the Asian ind indices, has not produced a single Nobel Prize winner. But that will start to change, and a lot will depend on how well Europe keeps innovating. How do we deal with an, also an aging population? Also what, what uh, some people call the useless class that's going to arise as, as jobs get automated, taken out by AI. And it's, it's how do we find leadership that can massage us through that. But most of, the, most of the projections that look at what will happen if there's high levels of climate change by 2050 is that Europe will be, will be a continent of zero growth. And I, I'm a Byzantine historian by training. I love zero growth. I don't like inflation. I don't like change. I like the world of Constantinople, which for a thousand years uh, only once had to change its currency value and devalue its currency. It's a, the, the, the capitalist world where we demand and expect um, uh, uh, the kinds of things that we've learned about in the last 20, 30 years, last two or 300 years in Europe's case, are, are, are abnormal. And it could be that in a world of no growth, we have to regulate our societies and have our different expectations set up in a different way. We are out of time. Uh, Peter just flew in and he's flying out tomorrow. No better proof of how much he loves Jaipur. So please give him a very special round of applause. We wish to thank Peter Frankopan and Bruno Mackeys and the Aga Khan Foundation for the very enlightening session. With this, we conclude our first day at the 13th Z Jaipur Literature Festival in association with Nexa. We hope you had a lovely time. Don't forget to pick up your tickets for the music stage. We have the Rajasthan Josh Kavali experience, followed by Ricky Cage tonight. We'd also like to thank our generous sponsors, starting with Z, the title partner, and the author book signing area, which is also a part of Z's kiosk at the front lawn. Next are the associate partner and the venue partner front lawn. Bank of Baroda, venue partner better. Before we thank our sponsors, we have a special contest that we're running. Hi guys, uh, before the day is over, I think a good day requires one last surprise. The good folks back at Zomato have a goodie bag for one lucky winner in the audience. Is that you? Okay, so could bag? you please come claim your goodie bag? Congratulations. Let's hear it for our lucky winner. She gets the Zomato goodie bag. Coming to thanking our generous sponsors, starting with Z, our title partner and author book signing area, which is also a part of the Z's kiosk at the front lawn. Nexa, the associate partner and venue partner for front lawn. Bank of Baroda, venue partner, Bethuk. Motwani Jadeja Foundation, when you partner Darbar Hall, Rajasthan Tourism, our tourism partner, the JCB Prize for Literature Bookstore managed by Full Circle, Aga Khan Foundation, our series partner, Rekit Benkesa, the official cause partner, Diageo, the celebration partner, Jan Mikalski, Zomato, the North India Office, US Embassy, New Delhi, our series partner, British Council, our session partner, Penguin Random House, Netflix, our session partner, Etsy, our session partner, Mahindra World City, Jaipur, our series partner, Public Health Engineering Department, our session partner, Jeshri Perwal International School, 